Hello, everyone, and welcome to the New Hampshire Food Alliance September webinar. As I said in my chat just a couple of minutes ago, we have over 100 people signed up for the webinar today. And so we're going to give folks just another minute or two. People tend to sign in right at, um, right at the last moment. If you don't mind, as soon as you come in, if you could mute yourself, that way, um, since we have so many people joining us, we can avoid some of that background noise. And also, we can just keep our videos off. Again, that'll just avoid some of the distraction. So we'll get started here in just a moment. Um, we're really excited to have Fiona Wilson here with us today. I am going to turn it over to her in just a minute. Um, but first, I'll just tell you a little bit about the New Hampshire Food Alliance. I'm Erin Hale. I'm a research and network coordinator with the Alliance. And as many of you know, we are a statewide network that connects people, ideas, and resources across the food system in New Hampshire. We work with partners throughout New Hampshire and the New England region, um, shared goals and strategies designed to build a food system that works for all people, communities, businesses, and the environment. Right now, our focus has been on strengthening and supporting farm fish and food enterprises, while also expanding access to local food and protecting our land and water resources through our viability initiative. Check out our website, NewHampshireFoodAlliance.com, to learn more about what we do and about all the exciting projects our action teams are working on right now. So we're really happy to welcome Fiona Wilson. She's the director of the Center for Social Innovation and Enterprise here at UNH. One of our goals as a network is to encourage and provide space for innovation in the food system. And Fiona is gonna talk with us today about an opportunity for food system entrepreneurs with great ideas called the New Hampshire Social Venture Innovation Challenge. We hope to inspire more people who work in the New Hampshire food system to enter the challenge and get support for and share their great ideas. Um, but Fiona's talk today won't just be about that or exclusively for New Hampshire entrepreneurs. We know that there are a lot of folks signed up today who are coming from across the country and we are very happy to have you here with us. So Fiona is going to give an overview of how social innovation and social entrepreneurship can be tools for all of us working on food system transformation. All right. So Fiona, I'll turn it over to you now to get started. Thanks so much for being here with us today. Yes, thank you, Erin. I'm, I'm honored to be invited and super happy to spend the next hour or so with you all. Um, so I'll just quickly tell you a little bit about uh, the center that I run uh, here at UNH with some amazing colleagues. It's called the Center for Social Innovation and Enterprise. And uh, I know social innovation may be a term that some are familiar with and some aren't, but it's uh, just, so I'll just share a quick definition. We, we really view social innovation as, as a methodology, as an approach um, for really for positive social change. And it, it really embodies elements of systems thinking, it's very solution oriented. It's absolutely about innovation. It's about scalability. It's about financial sustainability, and it's also about sort of impact measurement and assessment and sort of that idea of collective impact. And I think, you know, we, 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 we are a joint venture between the business school here at UNH and also our School of Public Policy. Um, and while, you know, we continue to see other, uh, other levers for change, you know, the, perhaps some of the more traditional ones, such as philanthropy and advocacy, um, and community engagement, um, we tend to focus more on those two levers for sort of social change, uh, sort of market-based, uh, responsible market-based solutions, um, and also public policy-based solutions for that, for that social change. So um, our mission at, 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 at the center is, is to really work with our students, our faculty at UNH, but also very importantly with local sustainable businesses and NGOs both here and around the world and our mission is very much focused on inspiring training and supporting the next generation of what we call change agents or change makers so we uh, we do some research but we are primarily a center 
that is about uh, experiential learning and community engagement. So we primarily uh, look to engage with students who we know that this generation, millennials and Generation Z, are, are absolutely students who are hungry uh, to make a positive impact in the world. They, they want to use their future careers for, 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 for good. And so, but they often struggle with knowing how specifically to do that. And so our goal is to provide them with those tools and those skills and habits of mind, as well as really concrete and exciting opportunities to apply and hone, and hone those skills in community settings. Um, and, and, and that's why, you know, I really emphasize the, the pivotal role that our partnerships with, with local and regional and national businesses and NGOs really play in our work. Um, almost all of our programs are, are what we call engaged learning or high impact learning, where our students with the supervision of our, of our faculty are going out into the community using the things that they've learned in the classroom and really applying those to consulting projects, to internships and, and other ways that they can make a, uh, an impact in the community. Um, so as I said, we, we, we tend to focus on the kind of helping create change makers. Um, and just to, just to share a couple of thoughts with you, um, Ami Duncan, who's the former uh, Secretary of Education, David Brooks, who many of you probably read in the New York Times, they, they both you know, relatively recently talked about this real need, um, this sort of 21st century competency that, um, that society needs and that we believe that universities should be teaching to our students. Um, so we are, you know, we're really trying to help uh, graduate our students um, as people who, you know, know how to identify problems, see patterns, and really figure out innovative and creative ways to solve some of society's most pressing uh, sustainability challenges. So I'm just going to mention uh, briefly um, uh, one of the pro one of the many programs that we run, and I, I do encourage you if you're interested in our work, if you're interested in being one of our community partners, um, please check out our website. It's just unh.edu forward slash social hyphen innovation, um, and you can read more about our internship and other programs. Um, but I'm just going to talk today about the New Hampshire Social Venture Innovation Challenge. Um, it is a competition that we started uh, almost six years ago now um, in collaboration with the Nobel Peace Prize winner, Mohammed Yunus. He's probably one of the most famous social entrepreneurs in the world. He was the founder of the Grameen Bank um, and uh, is sort of seen as the father of the microfinance movement that really has helped lead, sort of, uh, lead millions of people around the world out of poverty by making these small uh, unsecured uh, micro loans. Um, but we were honored to start the competition in partnership with him. And one of the one of the things I think that's important about it is that it's an idea or a concept stage competition. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. Um, so uh, as Erin mentioned, I think briefly at the beginning, um, it currently is a competition that is focused on the state of New Hampshire. Um, and we have two tracks. We have a student track, which is open to uh, any uh, student enrolled in a college or university in the state of New Hampshire. Um, and then we also have a community track, which is open to any resident of New Hampshire or any UNH alum. Um, so I apologies for those of you that are not in New Hampshire and not eligible. Um, but um, those of you that are eligible, we would love to have you consider entering this competition. Um, there are a couple of stages to this competition, um, a preliminary round and then finalists advance to the final round. Um, but as I said, it's really a night, it's a competition that is, there are many competitions out there and some are more traditional business plan competitions that require, you know, 10, 20 pages of, of business plan. This is not that competition. Um, this is really a way to just stimulate some innovative thinking to help shine a, a light um, on people who have really great ideas and, and help get them resources to be able to take their ideas forward. So, if you've sort of had an idea that's been percolating in the back of your mind, something you or your organization is, is, is about to embark on or is doing feasibility studies for right now, um, this is a great opportunity to just sort of put pen to paper, 
share those ideas with a with a, a panel of expert judges and and then hopefully get get um, some resources to help you take those ideas forward. Um, so, Erin, um, if you wouldn't mind going to the video next on the next slide, that would be great. Erin, I'm not hearing the the the, uh, the audio for that video. I don't know if others are. So what's your idea? UNH's Social Venture Innovation Challenge. I don't know. Is he? I think he's still there. That idea into social change. It is super easy to enter. This is an idea competition where big ideas are rewarded. No detailed plans are required. You just need to outline a problem and your innovative solution in a two-page written summary and a three-minute video. There are two categories. One, open to all undergraduate and graduate college students at any college or university in New Hampshire. And a second, open to all UNH alumni anywhere and New Hampshire community members. This year, over $25,000 in cash plus other prizes will be awarded. Imagine how that could propel your idea into reality. That's exactly what happened to me. My team's idea was to take the UNH Trash to Treasure program that we started as students in 2011 and scale it to campuses across the country. We are now helping to divert trash from landfills on over 40 campuses nationwide. Be a part of this new global move. Visit unh.edu slash SVIC to register and get all the details. Take that wild idea and turn it into a reality. Thank you, Aaron. Then go to the next slide. Thanks, that's perfect. Um, so it, it is a competition that uh, really, as you heard in that video, uh, is, is, is about any kind of sustainability challenge. Um, and we have an incredible breadth of entries every year. Um, but I did want to just highlight a couple of past contestants and winners who have very much been in the food system. I'm just going to share two examples with you, but um, every year we have a very good handful, uh, if not more, that are food system oriented. So this is absolutely a competition that is relevant to many of you on the phone today. Um, so the, the, actually the first place winner last year in the student track um, was one of our graduating students. Uh, his name is Andy DeMeo. And with his wife, uh, he proposed an idea for uh, a company called Half Acre Beekeeping. Um, and we were thrilled that Andy won first place and won uh, cash and, um, and legal services and marketing services to really help take his idea forward. So he won the competition back last December. Um, and by the spring, he was launching his business. Um, they have just completed or they're just completing the, the, their first season of Half Acre Beekeeping. Um, what I really like about uh, the, 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 their model is it, it's a for-profit company. Um, I think what the judges responded to is that, you know, it really is responding to a major environmental food system issue, which is colony collapse disorder, and really recognizing sort of the vital roles that bees play in our food system. Um, and so while they do offer full-service beekeeping, uh, I think what's really innovative about their model is their, their hive share model. So many of us would love to have uh, honeybees, have hives, but we just simply don't have the kind of uh, property where we can have uh, a hive. Um, and so they, they have uh, created a model whereby they are placing um, multiple hives um, on land typically owned by local farmers, um, but you or I um, can, can have ownership or part ownership of one of those hives. So um, really great, really great team of people, really great idea, and has been really gratifying to see them uh, take it forward. They, they, they put, um, they went, sort of they opened, they opened their doors for business uh, online in the early spring. They had the capacity, I think, to, for about 50 customers um, in, that, in, in this first year, and they had sold out within about two weeks. 
So a really great uh, success just in their first year. You can go to the next slide, please, Erin. Um, another, another winner that some of you in New Hampshire may be familiar with um, that won the second place in the community track back, back in 2014 is Harvest to Market. Um, as many of you may know, Harvest to Market uh, really pioneered uh, an online platform to connect uh, buyers and sellers in the local food system. Um, and their, their winning entry in 2014 um, was not to start that organization. They, they started back in 2009, I believe, but their entry was for um, a significant expansion and it was, to, it was to take what they'd done here in New Hampshire and to, to scale it nationally. Um, and so that, that, that is very much an option. Um, it can be for a new or a pre-launch organization, but it can also be for an organization that's been around for, for some time and is looking to launch a significant new strategic initiative like uh, Harvest to Market was back in 2014. Next slide, Erin. So, um, as I said, the, 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 new, the New Hampshire Social Venture Innovation Challenge is, is, is very broad. We, we, we are open to ideas for any sustainability challenge, and we tend to use the United Nations, uh, the framework of the Sustainable Development Goals, as a way to sort of really encourage uh, entries across a broad range of car uh, uh, categories. Um, and of course, you know, those of you who are working in, in the food system, um, you touch so many of these 17 goals, right? Um, um, so, so much of what you do is about poverty alleviation and eradicating hunger if you're working in food insecurity. It's about climate action. It's about water if you're working on the environmental side. And, and, and as we know, the food system is inherently a sort of interconnected uh, entity and so uh, many of you are working on one or many of these 17 sustainable development goals. Next slide. Um, so I don't need to tell you all this because you're all involved in, this, in, in, the, in the food system um, but as we look to create a more sustainable food system obviously we're thinking about issues of the environment, about human health impacts, we're thinking about social and economic justice. We're thinking about vi vibrant, thriving communities and community economic development. And we're also thinking about making sure that all people, regardless of income, um, have access to affordable and high quality food. Next slide. So, um, some of the thinking that I've been doing over the last several years is really to try and think about you know, why can't we transition more quickly to a sustainable food system? And what are some of the barriers that are preventing that from happening? And I think, you know, one of, the, one of the barriers is that, you know, for some of the negative externalities that the industrialized food system has created, that I'm sure many of you on the, on the call are more than familiar with, you know, the industrial food system does work for some, right? And it works because it has focused on building incredible economies of scale in production, distribution, in marketing. It's focused on utilizing really um, efficient, you know, looking for seeking efficiencies wherever possible in terms of, you know, highly mechanized methods, using chemical inputs. Um, of course, a lot of, you know, the industrial food system and big ag also benefits in some cases from pretty significant gov government subsidies. And that all translates to lower costs of goods sold for producers, right? It, it, it costs producers in the industrial food system, you know, in most cases, much less to produce the food. And so that does, you know, translate uh, oftentimes to lower prices for consumers. Next slide. And that same kind of system then, right, really creates some factors that are, that make it harder for smaller farmers or smaller food producers or smaller food entities to compete and to really make traction in a system that has been so dominated for so long by the industrial food system. Um, you know, smaller farmers, smaller producers don't enjoy those economies of scale. 
they don't have, you know, they tend not to have as much, um, you know, efficiency in terms of, you know, mechanized methods and chemical inputs also many less government subsidies for the most part and so that you know the same analogy holds true that that all translates to to, to higher cost of goods sold for producers and you know most of the time that then results in higher prices for consumers next slide Aaron. and so you know one of the one of the sort of, di sort of dilemmas that i've been really wrestling with over the last few years is these sort of two seemingly opposing issues that you know those of us that work in trying to create a more sustainable local food system that I think we all wrestle with which is you know on the one hand you know we really want to make sure that we can help small scale local sustainable farmers and food producers achieve financial viability right you know we will only have a thriving food economy if we have farmers who can survive um, and ideally we'd do that as well without government subsidy um, but then on the other hand, you know, increasingly, you know, our food system work is really thinking about issues of, of social justice and equity and diversity. And so one of the big questions we have is, you know, how can we also make sure that people, regardless of income, you know, have affordable access to healthy, local and sustainable food? Uh, next slide, Aaron. So these kind of uh, how might we questions, right? I think these these kind of big, uh, overarching, sometimes seemingly unsolvable, how might we questions are faced by social entrepreneurs all over the world. And I wanted to spend just a little bit of time today um, sharing with you a methodology that was pioneered by the folks at IDEO, and in particular, their nonprofit subsidiary called IDEO.org. Um, I have such great admiration for the work that uh, both IDEO and IDEO.org have done over the last couple of decades. Um, and I think, I, I think the methodology that they have pioneered um, called human-centered design, sometimes people call it design thinking, but in, a sort of, in, 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 in my context, we call it human-centered design. It's really a valuable approach um, for any of you who are trying to answer some of these kind of how big, big sort of how might we questions. Uh, next, uh, next slide, Aaron. So human centered design is, is really, as I said, a really powerful methodology or a tool. Um, and what does it mean? Um, number one, it means that uh, embracing the idea that all problems, even seemingly the intractable ones, like sustainable food systems and poverty and gender equality and clean water that they are solvable um, importantly it also means that believing the people who face the problems every day are the ones who have the expertise and the knowledge and ultimately hold the key to the answer um, and so because of that belief uh, human-centered designers seek to deeply understand the people that they're looking to serve and, and really seek to understand the underlying root causes of, of, of challenges um, and, and, and seek to uh, create solutions that are actually rooted in people's needs. So if we can go to the video now, I'm just gonna share a quick video with you that uh, brings this to life a little more. Uh, it's a video that was made by IDEO.org. I'll try this again. <laughs> Thanks, Erin. Human-centered design is a creative approach to problem solving one that starts with people and ends with innovative solutions tailored to meet their needs. When you understand the people you're trying to reach and then design from their perspective, not only will you arrive at unexpected answers, but you'll come up with ideas that they'll embrace. Human-centered design is both how you think and what you do with it. It's a process that consists of three phases, inspiration, ideation, and implementation. The inspiration phase is about learning on the fly, opening yourself up to creative possibilities, and trusting that as long as you remain grounded in the desires of the people you're designing for, your ideas will evolve into the right solution. In the ideation phase, we come up with lots of ideas. Some too crazy to work, some too crazy not to try, and you'll refine them, tossing out the bad and improving the good. 
making things helps you learn, grow, test your ideas. Building a simple prototype gets your idea tangible and gives you something to put right back into the hands of the folks you're designing for. Without their input, you won't know if your solution is on target or how to evolve your idea. So keep iterating, testing, and integrating feedback until you've got everything just right. During the implementation phase, you'll build partnership, shore up your business model, and get your idea out into the world, which was always the goal in the first place. Anyone can practice human-centered design. And everyone benefits because it gets us all to solutions that are adopted and embraced. Thanks, Aaron. We can go back to the slides. So uh, go forward a couple of slides. Yep, keep going. Keep going. Get yeah, perfect. So hopefully what you were hearing in the video was that there's, you know, there's a few mindsets um, that really are embodied by human centered design. Again, one is this idea of creative confidence um, that we all have expertise and we have ideas and that we have the ability to act on them. Next slide. Number two is about um, is about prototyping um, and that it's uh, we've really moved I think forward in the, in, the, in the last few years to really understand that if we can make uh, we take the risk out of the process by doing something very low cost very very simple first and using that as part of our data gathering before we invest a lot of money in creating an expensive solution next slide um, very much part of human centered design is this idea of failure. You know, we talk about this with our students a lot because in college, I think for so long, we have droned into students that it's all about getting 100% on the test, right? And you have one chance to, to you know, ace the exam. But in, in social entrepreneurs understand that um, actually the ability to, to do something and fail and learn from it and do that multiple times is actually a much more val valuable sort of way to learn. And so uh, human centered design really is about learning from failure, doing sort of small mini experiments along the way. Next slide. Um, empathy, you know, I think the, the, the work of building a more sustainable food system um, has so many aspects to it, but it is absolutely cultural and behavioral. And so, you know, really embedding people in the way that we think about solutions for a more sustainable food system and, and generating that, that empathy and that understanding so that we really understand the people in the system that we're trying to impact. Next slide. Uh, ambiguity, for sure. Um, you know, we, we, I think in, in, in using this, this approach, uh, social entrepreneurs, you know, spend a surprising amount of time not knowing the answer. Right, and that is good and encouraged. Next slide. Uh, optimism, uh, kind of, you know, I think it's sort of self-evident. Next slide. And again, you know, just to reiterate this idea of prototyping and that, uh, you know, uh, it, it involves multiple stages of iteration. We're, ne we're not gonna create a perfect solution first time around, and that is part of the journey. Next slide. So I just want, again, want to sort of say, you know, uh, what an incredible resource IDEO is. They, they certainly are a nonprofit consulting firm and they do work with uh, organizations for profit and nonprofit around the world to help them design solutions to some of humanity's biggest problems. Um, but they are also incredibly generous and in sort of open sourcing this. So if you go to their website, um, you will see there's a lot of different free resources, including their design kit. Um, they also have uh, free access to online courses. Some of them are self-paced. Um, and so if, it, if this is, has inspired you, I, know, I couldn't possibly tell you more than just a little bit about this methodology and in, in the time we have, but um, it is a wonderful methodology to learn and sort of use in your own organization. Um, so I'd very much encourage you to, to go to IDEO's IDEO.org's website and check out some of the some of their online courses that are free and their design kit is also free. Next slide. So just back to these uh, two seemingly opposing issues that we face, uh, those of us that are interested in creating a more sustainable food system. 
And so I want to just talk about, you know, how we might use uh, sort of the approaches in human-centered design to address some of those. Um, next slide, Aaron. And so, you know, when we think of solutions, you know, there's, there's some possible things we might do, right? We could increase volumes, um, new, possibly larger markets at different, possibly more affordable price points. We could try and increase productivity for smaller growers. We might be able to try and get smaller growers access to sort of right-sized equipment for small-scale farms. We might be able to use equipment and methods to extend the growing seasons, particularly here in the Northeast. We might be able to reduce wastage, which helps us save costs and therefore increases profitability. Um, another way we might, you know, increase profitability for farmers would be, you know, increasing price premiums through perceived value or developing um, the infrastructure and the skills for value-added products. And of course, um, you know, the fourth one is really about, you know, how do we increase economies of scale? If you remember back to my slides, you know, a few minutes ago. I just want to say, I think, you know, I think sometimes, um, and, and I recognize that, you know, many of you are probably doing many of these things already, right? I mean, the growth in, in CSAs and farmers markets and online farmers markets, you know, absolutely speak to some of these interventions to move us towards you know, a more, a more viable, sustainable food system. Um, I, think, I think, you know, I often hear that sort of those of us in the sustainable food system are sort of a little bit kind of wary of or skeptical about or, you know, think sort of economies of scale are kind of an evil concept because they're so linked with the industrial food system. But I would really encourage people to think about, you know, how do we, how do, we do that in a way that is, responsible, ethical, um, you know, more conscious of, you know, the negative externalities that can be created when you focus on economies of scale um, and to, to create a more viable business, right? That, that these two, this idea of sort of sustainable food and economies of scale don't have to be mutually exclusive. In fact, I would argue that perhaps uh, we need to embrace the ideas of economies of scale if we are going to truly transition to a more uh, sustainable food system, ultimately. Next slide. So I wanted to share just uh, two examples with you of organizations that I admire a lot, that I think really embody um, these ideas and you know, have really sort of embraced the ideas of human-centered design to, to make uh, organizations that are being successful. Um, so the first one is Revolution Foods, um, they're based on the West Coast. Um, and the, the, the challenge, the sustainability challenge they really sought, sought to address was that um, school meals is in most, uh, many places, maybe most places still, um, are just not great. Um, they're not particularly healthy, they're not particularly local, and so, you know, given that so many kids in this country rely on their school for their lunch every day, and in some cases their breakfast too, um, this is not, you know, this is not a great, uh, a great scenario, right? We're, we're teaching kids, you know, in school to eat health food that is not super healthy, not, su not super local, um, and it's not setting them up well for later life. You know, of course, the challenge, you know, in, in the school food, the school lunch system is that there's incredible pressure on costs, right? Schools don't have huge budgets. They are absolutely focused on how they can deliver, you know, filling food and calories at a price that will fit within limited school budgets. And so Revolution Food uh, set out to really address that. Um, and they really used ideas of scale, economies of scale, to allow them to deliver really high quality food, in many cases using local farmers, but to do it at a price point that is lower than what a school system can uh, produce themselves. So they've primarily been working in, in large urban areas, places like Los Angeles that have um, many, many large public school systems. And they have a, a centralized um, production facility where the food is made and prepared and then uh, delivered each day uh, to the schools where the schools will, will heat it and serve it. 
Um, they've also, you know, found ways to work in each of their, and they now have these hubs in, in uh, many uh, major urban, uh, urban areas around the country. Um, they found ways to integrate smaller uh, local producers into their supply chain. The other thing I wanted to just really emphasize with Revolution Foods and I think why they're such a great example of, of human-centered design because, you know, they really understood the kind of the root cause of the problem, which was, you know, schools weren't, wasn't the schools didn't want to provide healthy food to kids, but they just didn't have the financial, um, sort of the financial um, flexibility to do that. It was very hard for them to do that. Um, but they also understood that kids would only eat the food if it was really great appealing food to kids, right? And we all know the challenges of getting kids to eat healthy food. So they did an incredible amount of work with kids, with chefs to really develop healthy food that was also appealing to kids. So they sort of really put their users um, at the center of their design process. So Revolution Foods is, is, a, is a certified B Corporation. Um, so it is a for-profit company, but it is a company that has um, been certified as, uh, as a company that uses business for a force for good in the world. And I'm happy to talk about B Corp in the Q&A if, if anybody is interested. Next slide. So here's just a little bit about Revolution Foods Impact. You know, I think because of the excellent way they designed their model and then iterated and refined it over time. They're now, they've now scaled and are able to serve two and a half million meals per week nationwide, 2,500 sites in 35 urban areas, um, almost 100,000 pounds of vegetables a week. Um, so a really great success story and founders of this company um, are just incredible social entrepreneurs. Next slide. Um, you know, I also want to just to, to sort of note that I think sometimes, you know, I think there are, there, it, there is a, pos, there are paths forward to create profitable, successful, for-profit companies that also achieve social and environmental objectives. And I think Revolution Foods is a great example of that. Um, I also think that if we want to think in a complete way about a sustainable food system that sometimes we may need nonprofit solutions. And so I want to just talk a little bit about sort of social enterprises and one in particular, next slide. So the second case that I wanted to share with you, which is Wholesome Wave, and I'm sure many of you know Wholesome Wave, but I wanted just to sort of talk a little bit about why I think it is so socially innovative and why I think it really embodies the ideas of human-centered design. So their, their mission, for those of you that don't know, is to really uh, empower underserved uh, consumers and communities to make better food choices by increasing affordable access to healthy produce. And so they've done that in a couple of different ways. So the, the first way is their, is, their, is, their, is their SNAP program. So through their nonprofit, and you know, they are funded uh, through grants and uh, philanthropically and uh, in other ways. Um, they are able to double the value of SNAP um, when it's spent on fruits and vegetables. Um, so a shopper will go to a participating farmer's market or grocery store, they shop with their SNAP um, as usual, but they double their purchasing power um, when they buy uh, fruits and vegetables. Next slide. Um, the other piece that they have really pioneered, um, again, and I think this really speaks to, you know, how do you actually create the behavioral change that you want to see? How do you really encourage uh, people who are living on limited incomes and who are SNAP beneficiaries to actually change their behavior? And so they understood that, that doctors and health workers have a lot of prestige and status. Um, and that we tend to listen to our doctors. And so um, for the last number of years, they've been partnering with, with doctors um, and doctors will actually write a prescription now for fruits and vegetables. Um, and the patients are then able to bring that prescription to the participating farmers markets or stores uh, to, to produce, to, to buy produce. Next slide. Um, and so then if you look at, um, if you look at the impact that Wholesome Wave has been able to achieve, um, they now have a, a, a national network of 1400 farmers, markets and grocery stores. 
um, where they are where they are offering um, these 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 services. Next slide. Um, the last thing I want to just talk about is sort of a more recent thing that that Wholesome Wave has been doing, which is um, which is a partnership. They they really saw that um, you know they were solving some problems, but they continued to see you know huge volumes of nutritious but sort of you know cosmetically imperfect fruits and vegetables, and they're being discarded because they fall short of most kind of mainstream grocery grocery store standards. And you know, by some estimates, farmers are unable to sell about 40% of their crop due to these sort of little cosmetic imperfections. It's a real challenge in our food system. You know, and at the same time, of course, we've got millions of Americans struggling to put healthy food on the table because they just can't afford it. Next slide. And so what Wholesome Wave uh, started in 2017 with, in a partnership with Appalachian Sustainable Development is to, um, is to create uh, this uh, system whereby um, Customers can go to find a participating grocery store and they uh, can find this symbol. You can see that they're, they're practically perfect. They've sort of branded these things that they're sort of ugly vegetables, but they're practically perfect. They're still healthy. They're still nutritious. They're still good to eat. They find those, those, that, those stickers in the store and then they are able to buy those fruits and vegetables at a substantial discount. So again, I really, I think a really uh, inspiring social innovation that um, I think has the potential to be replicated in many places. Next slide. So again, um, I've just done a racing version of uh, social innovation and this methodology called human-centered design. I've hopefully given you a couple of examples of companies um, who really embodied those principles in the, in, in the solutions that they've created. Um, again, we'd just love to remind you about our Social Venture Innovation Challenge. The entries are due um, on November the 7th. Um, and I think there's one more slide, Erin, is that right? Yep. Yeah. Um, uh, this is not organized by my center, but I've been an advisor and a judge to this, uh, this other competition for many years and would encourage you to enter both. It's the New England Food System Innovation Challenge. Um, this is a, a, a slightly different model where teams apply to enter and if they're accepted, they get to spend um, a long weekend um, up in Maine um, working on their ideas, working with uh, mentors, working with advisors. Um, it's sort of like a, a hackathon, if you like. Um, you're there for a couple of days straight, kind of taking something that can be a really nascent nice idea and really uh, shaping it over the course of a couple of days and then presenting it, um, presenting it at the, end, at the end of the weekend. And I've, I've judged this competition now for a number of years and um, I think it's an it's a excellent program, um, very much designed for people in the food system. So if you're looking for that kind of experience, we'd encourage you to check it out. And I'll come back to that one. <laughs> So okay. thank you so much, Fiona, for, um, for all of these great ideas. That was wonderful. Um, we would love now to turn it over to all of you who have been listening um, and send us a message in chat. You can also actually raise your hand if you like, if you go to the participant folder and, and sort of hover over your name, there's a little hand. If you do that, I can actually unmute you individually if you wanna speak. But otherwise, just send us a message in chat um, to, to any of us, to Fiona, um, and we'll be happy to answer your questions. So Fiona, let's give folks just a minute to gather their thoughts. Sometimes it takes just a couple for folks to think about, think about those questions. And, um, and I'd love to just chat a little bit more with you. There was just so much fodder there to think about. Um, you mentioned at, at one point um, about B Corps and uh, B Corporations, and you had uh, an example, I think it was Revolution Foods was a, was a B Corporation. Correct. And yes. at one point you were saying, this is sort of what you think could be the model for our food businesses going forward if we're looking to transform our food system. Could you talk a little more about, about B Corps and what they are and what you see the promise for them? Of course, I'd be happy to. So, you know, in, in, the, in the food system, we have, we have a number of different um, certifications already, right? Like the USDA organic standard, like uh, fair trade. Um, 
and those are really important. Um, but they are certifications at the product level, right? So it's a way for consumers to say, this is a you know good product. You know, it is environmentally conscious. It, it pays uh, workers fairly. I can feel good about buying this product and I know that it sort of aligns with my values as someone who cares about sustainability issues. What, what B Corps do is sort of a similar thing, but they do it at the company level. So it's a way for a consumer to say, you know, in an, in the, in an objective way, you know, am I buying things from a good company, right? Mm -hmm. um, what does good mean, right? And so what B Corps have done, are, you know, have really uh, sought to create a certification that looks at a company holistically and evaluates it on its environmental practices, on its, on its employee practices, on how it works and treats, with supply, it treats its suppliers, you know, the nature of its products and services, and also how, how it's governed. Is it governed in a responsible way? Um, you know, it's really kind of part of this movement that you know, some people are calling conscious capitalism or responsible mm -hmm. capitalism, that you know, recognizing that you know, companies you know, don't have to make a choice between making money and doing good, that you know, companies, when, when it's done thoughtfully and carefully, you can absolutely design a business model that you know is creates value for shareholders and owners, but also um, you know creates profit in a way that is not det detrimental to other stakeholders in society. So the B Corp movement has been going for about ten years now. There's uh, close now to three thousand certified B Corps around the world. Um, some of the ones that you all might be familiar with, Stonyfield. Um, Stonyfield Organic here in New Hampshire is, is a certified B Corp. Their former parent company, Danone North America, um, actually became the largest, um, the largest publicly traded certified B Corp in the world last year. Um, and many, and many, many, um, Cliff Bar was a, Cliff Bar was, a, as many people know, a very sustainable food company, was, uh, was one of the founding B Corps, you know, eight or nine years ago. Um, so a lot of people in the food system um, have, have embraced B Corp certification and would definitely encourage people to check it out. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm curious, so is there like a, a B Corp website that people can go to um, to find out more? Yes, there is. It is. Um, let me just quickly. Maybe Sam, Sam, find it. Sam Case is our communications coordinator is online. Yeah, it's. If you have a yes, it's B, Yeah, it's bcorporation.net. So okay. just bcorporation.net. Right, right. And um, I'm, curious, I'm curious, Fiona, you work, your center is part of the UNH Paul Business School. Um, and is that part of the curriculum? Is that integrated into the curriculum much, this idea of, of B Corps and social sustainability and things like that? Or is that more of sort of an, a still elective for, for some students? No, I was actually um, more and more. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I teach a class called Business for People, Planet and Profit, which uh, that the whole semester is about that topic. You know, how do we create... Uh, successful businesses, viable, financially viable businesses that also have, you know, positive impact on society and the environment. Um, and I was just, uh, all of our, all of our business majors at, at Paul College are required to take a class on business ethics. And um, I was actually, uh, every semester I go into that course and, um, and actually teach a, a whole class, a module on, on this idea as well of, you know, how do we align profitability and environment environmental and social impact. So uh, more and more, we, we, we're using these ideas to anchor, you know, what a business education looks like. That's wonderful to hear. So it looks like we have a question um, from MP Kirna. I'm launching a food enterprise course this spring. Do you have any recommendations for a pool of case studies? Any ideas? Um, yes. Um, so um, and I'm happy to connect with you offline. Um, 
um, I'm not quite sure what her name is or his name is, but I'm happy to connect with you offline. <laughs> um, Mary, thank you. Um, um, Harvard Business School has some, Harvard Business School Publishing um, has, a, has a number. Um, I'd also encourage you to check out the Aspen Institute and um, they actually have a, a weekly newsletter called Ideas Worth Teaching, but you can also go and search um, past, you know, issues of that. They have some great, uh, some great resources, not just case studies, but also kind of curriculum that you can look at. Other people have developed. Um, yeah, I'm happy to connect with you offline, so that would be helpful. Um, Joel Moyer, I see you're online here. I got an email from, from you right before this webinar started about the Fair Food Network Business Boot Camp, and I wasn't sure if you'd like to tell folks about that or in chat if you want to share a link to that program. Joel's one of our, um, the Fair Food Network is one of the New Hampshire Food Alliance partners. Um, so Joel was sharing this new opportunity with the network. So if, if you'd like to type that in here, then everybody here online would be able to see that as well. Any other questions for Fiona? Uh, I think Sam let everybody know here that we will be posting a recording of, our web, of this webinar next week on our website um, and I think Eventbrite will notify you all when it's ready as well. Fiona, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. I'd love to open it up um, for anybody else to just share announcements, upcoming events, resources, other things um, with everybody else who's here with us today. And if not, if there's no other items to share, um, I just want to make sure everybody knows we have another webinar uh, next month, Tuesday, October 23rd, also at noon. And we'll be talking with Stacy Perslow from New Hampshire Farm to School and Beth Tenner of the New Directions Collaborative. Um, they'll be talking about Farm to School 2.0, how the Beacon communities in New Hampshire are transforming food system relationships. So I hope we, you all can join us again for that webinar. And thank you again so much, Fiona. I would encourage everybody to share the information about the Social Venture Challenge with your partners in New Hampshire. It would be great to get some more food entrepreneurs to participate this year. Yeah, thank you, Erin. It was a privilege to be uh, with, with you and everyone today. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Oh, thank you. All right, take care, everybody. We'll talk to you next month.